Welcome, everyone, and welcome to our first ever Learning Academy. Um, I would like to begin in a good way by offering you a land, our land acknowledgement. I would like to respectfully acknowledge that today I'm located on the Treaty 20 Michisagi Territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagi and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Boussoulet, and Georgina Islands First Nations. We are grateful for the opportunity to be on this land, to learn, to teach, and to grow. And I know all of you, no matter where you are joining us from today, will join me in acknowledging the traditional lands where you are and share in this gratitude because we are all treaty people and we must continue our journey to strengthen our understanding of our treaty relationships and of how to move forward in a good way. So this is an exciting day. This is the first in a series of three that we're doing uh, this fall on uh, governance with our guests. Uh, this is a new format for us. We're doing webinar as opposed to a, a giant Zoom meeting. So at a few points, I'm just gonna outline a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the learner, this learning, uh, Leaders Academy, I always wanna call it learn, anyway, I wanna change the name. Uh, the Leaders Academy came about because we heard loud and clear from our members about the desire for more professional development. And governance is always an issue top of mind. And as I was thinking about beginning this today, I am reflecting on the fact that even as a 20 year trustee, even every time I do a professional development session like this, I still learn something. I learn something new. And so uh, this is really, really important for us. We always need to remind ourselves that we are we should all be guided by good governance. Um, and we all know that this ministry right now has a focus on uh, learning and professional development for trustees. And we're able to say, look, here's what we're doing. We believe in ha having our members be the best they possibly can as well. So we're very pleased to be doing this. As I said, there will be two more sessions after this. Uh, a few points about today's session. At a few points during the session, uh, Marion's going to ask for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A box. You know, uh, we'd like you to identify yourself, your board, and please ensure that your question is related to the content being delivered and is of general application rather than uh, with respect to a specific situation or personal cir circumstance at your board. If your question does not get answered today, please email opspa at inquiry at opspa.org and we'll see what we can do about getting an answer or perhaps it fits better into one of our future sessions. So I'm gonna introduce you to our keynote and our speaker today. Um, Marion Thompson Howell, as many of you know, was with us at our AGM in the spring. Uh, it was a sold out workshop. Uh, I, so many folks said to me afterwards, I couldn't get in and that included me. Uh, Marion is a leader in corporate learning and development and has extensive experience in board governance and organizational leadership. She was elected as a trustee for the Waterloo Catholic District School Board in both the 2003 and 2006 elections, serving as vice chair and chair of the board. She has served on the board of governors for St. Jerome's University and is past chair of the board for trustees for St. Mary's General Hospital in Kitchener. Marion consults with Ontario School Boards, and I know some of you who have joined us today have had the pleasure of having Marion at your boards. She provides, uh, she consults on the unique characteristics of governing in the education sector. So I don't want to take up any our, our time. I'm turning it over to you, Marion. Thank you very much, Kathy. And I am really pleased to be with everyone today. We have got a great uh, set of folks, a lot of people who are going to be with us today, well over 150. I'm just sharing my screen. Kathy, can you confirm that you folks can see my slides? I can see it very well. Thank you. Excellent. So that's the that's the technology piece that I wanted to get out of the way. I looked over the list of people who are attending today, and I recognize so many of your names. Uh, we've worked together with you um, before, so welcome back. I'm really glad um, that we can spend this time together. I can't see any of you on the screen, so I'm kind of envisioning you through my camera. But what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about meetings. And, you know, there is a saying that 
uh, you know, no one, oh, let me just get this to work here. Oh, no one ever said, oh, there we go. All right. Uh, no one ever said that, I, you know, I wish I could spend more time at meetings. Nobody ever says that people can't stand meetings. And yet I'm, I am one of those odd people who I quite enjoy going to meetings, but I enjoy going to meetings that are well run, that have a focus, that there is an outcome that I know when I leave, we're going to advance our work. And meetings are where trustees exercise your duty to care. That is the place that you do your work. And meetings don't have to be painful. They don't need to be boring. They do, however, need to be productive. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how we can make those meetings uh, productive. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about three Ps, process, people, and priorities. And by process, I'm going to look at structural issues around meetings. And, and under people, we're going to talk about us, how we interact, what we do in meetings. And under priorities, I'm going to focus on issues. Now, before I get into the first one, which is process, I have a couple of polls because I want to get a sense of um, how what you think about some of these topics. So TJ, if you could put up the first poll, please. So you're going to see a poll come up on your screen in a moment. And the question is, if students attended your board meetings, what percentage of time would they say you devoted to issues directly related to student achievement and well-being? So would you say that your board spends over 90% of its time? Would you say your board spends over 60% of its time? Or would you say less than 60? So I'm going to give you not very long but I want to give you just a couple of seconds, quickly vote how, you, how much time you think your board, if we were to do an audit on your minutes, what would those minutes tell us? So I'll give you just a short time. We've got so many people here. We can't wait real long for everybody, but this should be an easy one for you to uh, respond to. So TJ, you're going to see uh, how quickly people are responding. So how much time in those specific issues? All right, let's just see. Um, okay. TJ, if you can close the poll and show us the results. Okay. Hi, Marion, this should be there. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. So this is interesting. About 17% of you said that uh, over 90% of your meeting time is devoted to student achievement and well-being. Um, it, it would, that, that, that doesn't surprise me. What concerns me is that though those of you who say less than 60%, uh, the reality is the job of trustees is to focus on those two issues as well as the financial well-being of the organization. So one of the things that I want to do today is kind of talk about how we can tip that so that more of our meeting time is, in fact, devoted to those issues. So let's get started and begin by talking about process. So process are structure issues. So what do I mean by that? Uh, you, this is the piece you know, by the way. This is the stuff you guys know, and then we're going to talk about where we get into trouble. So effective meetings include a well-structured agenda. The agenda includes consent agenda. The, the sections of the agenda are timed. So both as the chair as well as the participant in the meeting, I know I have a sense of how much time are we devoting to each of those items. Uh, you know, I have this thing about page references, whether it's electronic, whether it's paper, I want to be able to jump around uh, the, the agenda. But also for each item, why are we dealing with this? Is this an outcome, uh, a decision? Is this just for information? Is it for discussion? The other thing about the meetings is that the reports that we get in meetings address the work of trustees. They don't address the work of staff. And the work of trustees has to do with two things, compliance with policy or previous direction, and progress on the multi-year strategic plan. Multi-year strategic plan for every board includes student achievement and well-being. So if, if that's what makes up an effective meeting, what happens instead? Well, 
First of all, for most boards, time is spent on items that belong in the consent agenda. We waste time in meetings talking about things that uh, we don't really need to talk about. So for those of you who do not use a consent agenda, a consent agenda is one item in the agenda that we put under that, those items that don't require discussion. Things like approval of the minutes of the last meeting, information items, sometimes committee reports, depending on what's in there, all go under one and it is approved through one motion. Do I have approval of the consent agenda? Boom, we move on. Now, it does not mean that trustees can't deal with those issues if they have a question, but they deal with them in one of two ways. If you have a question of clarification, so there's just something in uh, one of those reports I don't understand, I can call whoever did the report ahead of time, say, hey, I don't understand that. What does that mean? I don't have to take up board meeting time to do that. Or at the beginning of the meeting, I can ask the chair to pull that report from the consent agenda, place it elsewhere in the agenda, and uh, that we can deal with it then. So too much time still in boards. I am surprised don't use a consent agenda. The other thing that happens in board meetings is the chair really doesn't manage the meeting very well, doesn't manage conflict, uh, allows discussion to go off topic, allow people to be repetitive. Now that, you know, I'm not a big fan of you can speak once and once only. I don't think that that's reasonable for what we need to achieve. But by the same token, there are some people in meetings who keep coming back at issues. It's a chair's job to, to control all of that. What else happens in meetings that makes the process ineffective? Well, staff, include their reports in the agenda package ahead of time. And when they get to the meeting, and by the way, staff, I know we've got staff in here. So every once in a while, I'm gonna be talking to you. Um, once it gets to the meeting, they go over slide by slide, page by page, what people have already prepared for. And so trustees have an obligation to show up to the meeting prepared. If you've got a staff report, there should be a very quick, okay, here are two or three things I think you need to pay attention on. Let's go into discussion. We don't need to waste time. The reason many of our meetings are boring is because we are sitting passively as page after page after page of work I already prepared for is covered. Another challenge with uh, school board meetings is that trustees accept informational reports as evidence of compliance. Compliance is Here's what we said we were going to do. And here is the evidence of the progress we're making against that goal or achievement against that goal. It is not simply, well, we're doing these things without relating it back. Information reports are not, should not be used as measures of compliance, but we accept them all the time. In addition to that, uh, we have too many of our boards where meetings go on for hours and hours, sometimes into the morning hours. There is a problem with our agenda if, in fact, we are going into meetings that long. Usually what happens is trustees want to rehash usually operational business. It is not the work of the board that's taking us that long. It is operational, and we need to pull ourselves out of that. What else about our meetings that is a process challenge? <clears throat> we need rules to govern how the meeting operates. And many boards will say that they use Robert's rules or parliamentary practice. Now I gotta tell you, uh, I am not a big fan of, of parliamentary practice because we are not, uh, it is very restrictive. It is very restrictive. And any board that tells me that they use Robert's rules, I'm not sure that you do, unless in fact your trustees do stand when they speak, if in fact the number of times that they're um, uh, allowed to speak <clears throat> is limited. But we, we, still, we still defer to those. And any rules of engagement are useful for, ad for advancing the work of the board. The problem is we have many boards where whether it's parliamentary practice in, a, in another way or Robert's rules are used as a weapon. They're used as a weapon against colleagues around the table instead of used as a tool to support the work of the board. And then the, the final challenge is that, and, and this, I, you know, I've been discovering, particularly over the past year or two that I've been working with boards across the province. Uh, many of you are holding a board meeting once a month, 
and committee of the whole once a month. The community of the whole is being treated as a board meeting because you got too much work to do. And I go back to it usually is because you're focusing on operational issues. Committee of the whole is a great opportunity for the board to come together to do some of that strategic thinking, generative discussion, learning about issues that are going to help you in decision making when you get to an actual board meeting. But committee of the whole is not the same thing. And then the other challenge is committee of the whole is committee which means you cannot make decisions. The only meeting during which you can make decisions is a board meeting. And yet again, I've had many chairs who've come to me and said, but we had a really crucial issue. It was time sensitive. We were in committee the whole, we just did it then. Committees do not make decisions, only boards make decisions. So one of the challenges with uh, our meetings right now has to do with the, the 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 structure that we have in place and um, we're just not doing that effectively. Now, the second P has to do with practice issues and practice issues have to do with how we engage with each other. So I've got another poll for you. TJ, can you put up the second poll? All right, so here is the second question I have for you. Remember those students that were in question one? Well, if those same students were asked to describe the behavior of trustees during board and committee meetings, would they say that overall, the behavior of trustees as a group was exemplary, okay, but nothing to write home about, or embarrassing? Now, this is an anonymous reply, so you don't have to too worry, but how would you say uh, those students would uh, describe the behavior of uh, trustees. Okay. So, uh, TJ, it looks like I've got the results. So this is interesting, uh, about a third say that your behavior would be described as exemplary. Over half, it's kind of so-so. And about 14% would describe it would be as embarrassing. Um, that's interesting. Uh, it's interesting because our objective should be if we're working together effectively, shouldn't it be exemplary? It's what we would expect of students. It would be ex what we expect of our staff. It's what we expect of our administration. And yet the reality is what happens is when we get together, it's not always the case um, for trustees. So, you know, let's talk. And again, you folks know this. So what is it about trustee behavior that makes what we do around the table effective. Effective trustees understand and accept their roles as defined by the act and by their bylaws. Um, you know, we just went through an election, uh, what, just about a year ago. And uh, this happens, you know, every time we go through an election. As I go and I work with new trustees, what I discover is that by and large, many new people who come to the board table don't understand what the role of a trustee is. Our role, our job is described by the act. And yet, uh, because we are elected under the Municipal Elections Act, people often think that their role is the same as a city councilor, but it isn't. Once we are elected, our responsibilities shift to the Education Act. The only time that we are linked to the Municipal Act at all is uh, we're linked to the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. But our, it shifts to the Education Act. And the role of trustees has changed dramatically over the years. And uh, we no longer are selecting textbooks. We no longer are selecting the color of floor tiles, which happened at a point in time. Our job is defined as the end of the act to focus on student achievement and on well-being. That's primarily, there, there's a few other things, but that's primarily the role. 
And yet there are, are trustees throughout the province that will say to me, I don't really care. I was elected. I ran because I have a concern about X. And X almost always has to do with an operational issue. And so it's, it's you know, it's a lot of the conflict that's happening around your board tables has to do with not understanding and accepting what that is. And, and you know, my, my response always is, if you're a business owner and you have an opening for an employee in your organization and uh, you have a job description, you hire against that job description and you hire someone and bring them on board. And then on day two, they say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't like that job. I want to do this instead. It wouldn't be acceptable. They were hired to do something specific. And as trustees, we're elected to do something specific. The other thing that makes the work we do around the table effective is that we work as a team to advance the agenda of the system. I use the word system. In the act, you'll know this. In the word act, they don't differentiate board from board. And so board is board of trustees and board is what I call the system. So I use system to describe the schools and, and everything else that we do. And despite the fact that we run in an election and we may run against other people, once we get to the table, it's important that there's a coordinated and a cohesive um, activity to advance the agenda of the system. And that agenda is defined by our multi-year strategic plan. That's what our measure is, as well as by those directives and expectations that are handed down to us by the ministry. Uh, you know, the other thing that, that uh, effective trustees do is ask questions. That's our most important skill, is to ask questions. Questions that confirm compliance, questions that confirm that we're making progress against those really important goals, and, and to listen, not to come prejudged. And then the final, and again, you, you folks know this stuff. This is not the, you know, this is, this is not anything surprising for anyone. But um, the other is to come prepared. That means we have, as a duty of care, we have a fiduciary obligation to come to meetings prepared, to have gone through the agenda package, to come prepared with questions we have about things we see in the agenda package, to ask those questions of clarification before the meeting. So we don't waste everybody else's time just because I don't understand you know, one little item here, but it is to come prepared. And instead, there are too many trustees who show up with the comment of, well, I was busy. I didn't have time to go through this. Could you please go through that whole report for me again? It's just irresponsible and it doesn't demonstrate our uh, meeting our fiduciary obligation. So what happens instead? If, if, if that's how we show up, as I said, trustees often come unprepared and expect to be caught up. It is disrespectful. It's disrespectful to everyone else around the table. It's wasting really important and precious time that we have. We have an obligation to come prepared. The other, and I, you know, boy, anytime any of you have ever been with me, you will have heard me talk about this already, but I think that it is so important that it bears repetition. Uh, we have codes of conduct. Every board has a code of conduct and the code of conduct is there to provide a backdrop to help us understand what is acceptable behavior. Now, to be quite honest, I find it, you know, if, I, if I'm really cynical, I find it quite amazing that as adults, we have to write down what are appropriate rules of behavior. I mean, that just, that, that just absolutely amazes me. But having, that's my cynical piece. But I understand why we have them. And what is happening throughout the province is that rather than the code of conduct being used as a basis for people then coming together and saying, hey, we need to talk about something. We're, we're, we're not on the same page here. It's being used as a, uh, as a weapon. And it's being used, people are threatening each other. Uh, that's how we're showing up in the headlines. Uh, it is not being used effectively. And it's one of the reasons why with Bill 93, we're now seeing the ministry is stepping in because in all honesty, we're embarrassing uh, the education field. And so it's used as a weapon. That's not what it should be used for. It should be used as a springboard for helping us how to figure out what we can do and how we can do when we disagree with each other. 
Uh, one of the other things that happened, I said that as a practice issue, uh, what is really effective is that we ask questions, but that we also listen. We are there to learn. Uh, you know, one of the quotes I have on the slide is that, you know, all too often people think they're experts in education just because they went to school or because their children are currently in school. Uh, that doesn't make us experts. We hire staff who are experts. They're the ones who understand education. We're not. Our job is not to out-expert the experts. Our job is to ensure that our strategic objectives are being met relative to the needs of our, our students primarily, as well as to our staff. And so instead, many come to the table with biases, with viewpoints about how things should be. And that what they do is it affects their ability and willingness to listen and incorporate other people's views and to move away from whatever their position is. And that that is really too bad because we are not experts in, in curriculum. We are not experts in learning. That's what our staff are. And so as long as we're asking questions that are, are demonstrating their compliance. We are not there to dictate how these things should happen. What's something else that uh, influences our practice? When there is disagreement, I talked about uh, the, the code of conduct. When there is disagreement, what often happens is those dissenting viewpoints result in people becoming entrenched locked into their own positions rather than opening up discussion to find areas of commonality. Now, I've told this story a hundred times and I apologize those of you who have heard it already. But when I was elected for the first time in 2003, I joined a split board. We were the poster child for bad behavior. Uh, and uh, I ran. And when I joined the board, it was not a pleasant place to be. And quite frankly, I thought, I, I'm not spending another, in those years, that time it was three years, I'm not spending another three years in this toxic environment. This is not fun for me. But given what I do for a living, I decided, I, I, you know, I, I think I know a little bit about organizational behavior. So the ministry was having, um, shortly after we were elected, they have regional meetings, you know, you all go off together. So the regional meeting was coming up. And uh, it was somewhere an hour, an hour and a half away from Kitchener. I live in Kitchener. Uh, shout out, by the way, to the Waterloo Region folks who I know are in on the, the meeting today. Um, so I called up one of the people who was on the board with me, whose opinions I disagreed with. And I knew that we already were in conflict. So I called at home and I said, hey, meeting's coming up. Um, are you, uh, you're going to be going? And I said, I, you know, I've never been to that before. What if we drive together? Now, I got to tell you, there was about 30 seconds of silence at the other end of the phone. And then I said, well, it's OK. Let, let's go together. Tell you what, I'll drive. I'll pick you up. I don't know, 8 o'clock, whatever the time was. See you then. Now, I got off the phone and I thought, oh, my God, what have I done? I am now going to spend an hour and a half with a person who, quite frankly, I don't want to have a conversation with. But I knew we needed to. So I picked the person up, spent the first little while, you know, just chatting. And then finally, I raised the issue. And I said, you know, there's a lot of stuff we don't agree on. There's a lot of things that we have very different views, but I'm not, I don't think that that means we can't work together. Can we just talk? So we spent the rest of that ride talking, talking about why we believed what we did, what our objectives were, got to the meeting, and then we had to get in the car and drive all the way back. Now, I will tell you that that was transformative for our relationship. Uh, I consider that person a friend. Uh, I respect that person tremendously. Still don't agree with that person, but we learned to work together. So rather than staying entrenched, we took the risk. And that's what we need to do when those when, when we get into those positions. When we don't do that, uh, I've always suggested that the litmus test for me for dysfunctional boards is when after a board meeting, there are what I call those parking lot conversations, whether it's literally a, a small group of people standing in the parking lot talking, or whether it is through email later, or whether it's through telephone calls or whatever, uh, cliques form, factions form, and then they do nattering, but they don't say those things at the board table. It is my number one way to assess if a board is not functioning well. 
And uh, little effort is put into bringing everyone together. And instead, when those things happen, people start to put their energy into forming coalitions. So I see it a lot uh, just before we get into the December, the, the um, annual meeting, or I guess that's now been put forward in the year. But um, uh, when f uh, people will make deals, I want to be chair. If you vote for me, I'll do this for you. Rather than having a broader conversation, which I do with, by the way, one of the boards in the province uh, every year where we get together ahead of time and talk about, okay, what are the issues that are coming down the pipe that the board's going to have to deal with? What are the leadership characteristics we need in someone who's going to help us guide through that coming year? And then you, and then who, who, who around this table has those characteristics? That's the way that we're going to get a strong chair as opposed to building coalitions. And then the final point I want to make around, around this, and then I'm going to stop and, and see what questions you have, is that the questions that are asked usually um, are, are focused on, on operations, uh, but they don't advance discussion or they don't advance deeper conversation. And instead, what we should be doing is asking those big questions that are going to help advance our understanding and make sure that we have the information we need to make appropriate decisions. So when we take a look at meetings, one of the things we need to focus on are process issues, which is structure. One of the things we need to look at are people issues, which have to do with practice or behavior. And in a few minutes, what we'll do is we'll take a look at priorities or the focus. But I, I'm going to stop because I've been talking uh, a long time. Uh, Kathy, uh, you know, questions that may be um, being asked. What, what are people asking about? Yeah. Well, thanks, Marian. I have a whole bunch of questions of my own, but we'll save that for another day. Um, the one I've had this question a couple of times, yes. This is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel as well as the slides made available. And we'll let you know as soon as it's available on the YouTube channel. So that takes care of a lot of the questions. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question uh, about committee of the whole. I have, a, I have a question around committee of the whole meetings being held on the same day as the board meeting. And I'm just, uh, I'm going to kind of condense the question a little bit and uh, ask you to speak about that. Oh, if, is that uh, yeah. a, a good process? And then also ask about um, Committee of the Whole maybe being able to be held virtually and, mm -hmm. and board meetings held in person. And if, if you can give any okay. light about what the process should be around that. Sure. So let me deal with the last part first. So whether it be, so Committee of the Whole, I'm going to talk about committees generally. What many boards are now doing is committee meetings are being held virtually and board meetings are being held in, in person. Now that we're moving moving out of, remember I, I'm on a hospital board, so we're not out of the pandemic. <laughs> As we move out of the pandemic, many boards are, um, are, uh, are managing that way. Uh, but you know what, I mean, for some of your boards, you, you folks are pretty far away. So I mean, that whole ability to meet virtually, I think is gonna be a bit of a hybrid as, as we go forward. Let me talk about committee of the whole and committees. Before I do that, I'm going to introduce some language and, and think about your boards. You may use different labels, but think in terms of which one I'm talking about. So boards are going to hold open meetings. So you know that an open meeting is a meeting that the public has um, access to, the public can attend. Then there are closed or in-camera meetings and closed or in-camera meetings. Again, some of you use different terms, so I just wanna make sure. Are those meetings that are closed to the public? Those are the meetings where we have very strict rules about what we can do. We can talk about property, we can talk about HR. So they are those very, um, uh, those issues that, uh, that we can't let that information out right now. Now, you may have a, a closed or an in-camera meeting that is part of a board meeting. So it may precede your board meeting, it may follow your board meeting. I've been on boards where they place the in-camera piece at both ends, so it depends. Um, and, but that's that's considered part of the board meeting. Y you could have part of a committee meeting being an in-camera meeting. So think of those. Now there is a third, so for instance, at the hospital, at the end of every board meeting, we have what would be called an executive session. An executive session, uh, we have two. 
One is simply the trustees, as well as the president of the hospital, all other staff leave. And then we have one which is simply trustees. And that's where we talk about our work. We always ask ourselves the question, did we do our jobs? In fact, we asked the question, if a patient had been sitting and listening to us, what would the patient say about how we did, how we behaved in this meeting? So those are the kinds of things to think about. So now let me talk about committee of the whole. All right. Because when somebody asks the question, should committee of the whole precede or follow, you're usually talking about what I would call your in-camera meeting. All right. I, when I talk about committee of the whole, it is you've got on your boards variety. You may have a, a finance committee. You may have an, a governance committee. You may have an audit committee. They have certain members of the board, certain trustees on each of them. Committee of the whole is exactly the same, only everyone attends. The advantage of committee of the whole is that it allows you to take, to, it, committee should be less formal than a board meeting. They should not follow that parliamentary practice because you want to open up discussion. This is where the real work of the board gets done. This is where we assure ourselves that, we, that, that we're getting the background we need. Committee of the Whole is a fantastic opportunity. Some of those um, opportunities to learn about the, the, the system, to learn about what's going on in our schools, to learn about what's happening with certain populations within our schools. It would be a great time to have staff come in to talk to us about those issues, to explore those so that we have a deeper understanding. We're not making any decisions. It's just deepening our understanding so that at a subsequent board meeting, when we do need to make a decision, we're making it with the advantage of background information, not just on a bias I bring. So think in terms of that, that language and then kind of translate that to your board. I hope that helps, Kathy. I think so. Um, if it doesn't, we're going to send you the question uh, with more clarity because <laughs> right. uh, I have a number of questions and I want to get to a couple more. I've had two or three people say, ask the question around if you're if we're using Robert's Rules of Order as a as a means to kind of conduct our meetings and you're saying that it's perhaps not the best. What do you suggest? It's not so much that I don't think it's the best. I think that there are are. Um aspects, the, some of the structural aspects about the way we structure uh, motions, uh, some of those things that, you know, we, we, we take that from Robert's rules, we take it from standard parliamentary procedure. That's what I said, there, there are ways of, of running okay. that meeting. Uh, the, 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 where I have a problem with it is that, and by the way, the t it's extremely restrictive when it comes to the ability for trustees to exchange ideas, particularly if you only allow, you know, one time for someone to speak. And then if I want to come back to you, Kathy, and say, tell me more about that. Tell me, I, I, you know, I, I don't agree with you on that. I see this differently. Help me understand your viewpoint. In a, in a, in a very strict Roberts Rules meeting, that dialogue wouldn't go on. So, so when I talk about it being used as a weapon, um, you know, it's when you're in a meeting, I've, I've observed meetings where somebody gets angry and they just start yelling out point of order, point of order, point of, and, and you know, and they just want to shut down conversation. So I, you know, you need to have rules. You should be defining those in your bylaws, but to simply say in your bylaws, which boards do, we will follow Robert's rules. My only point is, no, you don't. Because I watch your meetings and I know you don't follow Robert's rules. That's all. <laughs> right. As somebody who spent a lot of time uh, sharing a hotel room with a parliamentarian, I can tell you that we don't follow Robert's rules. We no. we kind of do, and it yeah. sort of is, <laughs> but yeah. it's not. You, it's not. Uh, it's not exactly to the word of Robert's rules, and and that's somehow sometimes that's right. we need to do that to make things move along. I've got one other. I, I have a couple of questions about consent agenda items. I, yeah. I'm just wondering, and, and the, the theme seems to be, can you explain exactly what a consent agenda item is and how a board deals with it at the meeting? Sure. So uh, the consent agenda is, you know, your, your items on the agenda are numbered. And so say it's, you know, you do your land acknowledgement, say you do, um, um, you know, welcome, whatever. So, you know, item number three may say consent agenda. Under that on the agenda, we'll list certain things. 
Usually they include minutes of the meeting of, you know, whatever the last date was. Um, they, they will include, uh, I would suggest correspondence uh, that the board receives that doesn't need to be discussed. Uh, committee reports that um, have already been discussed at the board table. And, and, and you know, it's just, it's, it's more information. It's just to let you know what the committee did. So you're gonna make a decision every, when the chair and the director sit down to finalize the agenda. And let me talk about that very, very, very quickly because I found out that there's a number of boards throughout the province where the director does the agenda. The chair's not there. Mistake. This is not the director's meeting. This is a trustee meeting. So when the chair and the director sit down to finalize the agenda, you're going to decide um, what goes into that consent agenda. And they're just listed. So when the meeting goes on, we get to item number three. Chair says item number three, consent agenda. Could I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? You get a motion, a vote, move. Whereas in the old days, before we had a consent agenda, could I have a motion to approve the minutes? Could I have a motion to approve the receipt of correspondence? Could I have a motion to approve? It's just, it's just a waste of time. So now those items are in the consent agenda. And uh, let's say one of them is a letter. Here's a letter from OPSPA that's in that consent agenda. And um, it's about an upcoming webinar series. And uh, it's just an information item. Uh, if I'm a trustee, first of all, if I go, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I, I can just call before the meeting and say, hey, Ms. Director, or, you know, hey, you know, Mr. Chair, um, what's this all about? I, I don't want to take up meeting time on this. What's it all about? But if I don't do that, I could say, could we please pull that letter from the agenda or from the consent agenda? Chair has an obligation to remove the agenda. It's a non-debatable item. If a trustee requests something to be moved, it's pulled out and they say, okay, I'm looking at this. Uh, we're gonna add that as item 7.2. Puts it in 7.2. We go back and we vote on the consent agenda for all the rest of the items. It's a time saver. Now, the other thing about a consent agenda, and I'm gonna tell you there are two schools of thoughts on some of these things. I will tell you what under Marion's thinking, uh, my advice should never go in the consent agenda. Finance and report on student achievement, because mm -hmm. that's your job. That's your job. There are, you know, if you were to explore what other experts suggest, um, that I, I frequently will see what people will say, put the finances in there. I, I, I disagree with that. I think that they need to be out of the consent agenda. Consent agenda should be those things that do not require discussion. That's all it is. Now, the last thing I'll say about a consent agenda is because all of those are bundled, uh, I have boards who will say, well, we don't like to do that because uh, we wanna make sure that trustees have read everything and are aware of everything. A consent agenda, just because everything is bundled under one motion, does not absolve me as a trustee from being responsible for the content of what is in those, those uh, items in the consent agenda. I have the same obligation. It's simply a time saver in a board meeting. Great, thanks so much. I'm 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 looking at the time, and I'm wondering yeah. if you want to go back to the presentation. I, I have a lot of other questions, but we can we'll figure it out. So okay, go ahead. all right. I'm going to move forward, and then. Um, yeah, I'm going to move forward and then we'll see if we can have some more time. So remember what we did was we talked about process. We talked about people. I want to talk about priorities. And so the third item has to do with. Um, OK, I'm going to come back to that. I forgot that these were here. Remember, I talked about questions. There's three types of thinking we need to do at a board meeting. One is we provide oversight. That's where you exercise your fiduciary responsibilities. And the kinds of questions you ask yourselves are things like, something comes up, what are the top reasons why we're not hitting this target? Why do you think this metric is trending in this direction? It is looking backward at data, at stuff that already happened. But we also need to think strategically. This is not about developing a strategic plan. It is about strategic thinking, forward thinking. Now, um, there is strong arguments 
that 60%, if not 70% of board meetings should be focused on forward thinking. Uh, I know trustees are right now going, how could we possibly do that? Well, because again, I think we're spending too much time on operational issues, but that's a whole other thing. But you know, if we don't do strategic thinking on an ongoing basis, I don't know how you can possibly develop a strategic plan and know that those strategic objectives are the right objectives to be set. So you're asking questions like, all right, we're taking a look at what's been happening and what the trends are. If we keep going this way, where are we gonna be in two years? You're looking forward. Uh, what's the, the, the future of the classroom gonna be like? And how, what needs to be different than what we're doing now? And how are we thinking about that? And then the third type of thinking, and this is what we can do, <clears throat> sorry, in committee of the whole, is generative thinking. And generative thinking is simply where we get insight. I always talk about it as we have discussions, we learn about things. It's like throwing spaghetti at the wall and having it stick. I'm not making any decision on it, but someday down the road, I'm going to go, oh, you know what? I remember talking about that and I'm pulling that strand down. So, you know, things like what would we have to change in our culture in the future to be an educator of choice? I will tell you that the other question that I think every board should be, at some point should have a, a really open conversation about is why would someone select our system over that of our coterminous board? And if we can't answer that other than, oh, well, we have great staff and we have whatever, that's not the answer. Because, because you know, if, if, I, if we have a school here and the coterminous board builds a spanking new school here and we got a family living over here and they got to walk by that brand new shiny school to our little school, there better be a reason for it. That's the kind of thinking that also makes board meetings really interesting. So this one, I'm, I'm going to go over very quickly, but the boards I've worked with, June staff know that trustees are going to ask this. June is, is, um, is uh, budget month. Right now, board trustees will get budgets. We're not financial experts. By and large, very few financial experts are actually elected. We don't know what to do with a budget. And so we start to do line by line analysis. That's not a trustee's job. Instead, the kinds of questions we need to be asking are, are we in compliance? So it does it balance. What assumptions did you hold when the budget was created? So in other words, I want to know what drove you to, to invest here and not here. Um, you know, does it reflect our priorities for students? Are we mission consistent? Show me where we're reflecting what we said um, are, are our priorities. What's our, what's our ROI? What's our return on investment? So what services are we providing to what students at what cost? And what are the benefits and risks? Because the reality is we are going to have to make those decisions about investing more heavily in some areas than others. Are we being responsible stewards? Um, you know, something happens, we go to cut, where would we go? And so those questions, staff, I'm going to warn you, I tell every board of trustees, come June, be ready. Staff should be able to answer those questions. That's what it sounds like to have a really highly informed uh, board discussion. So my apologies, I should have done that before I broke for questions. So what's the third priorities? Uh, priorities are when we look at what we focus on. And as I said in the opening, historically school boards, this was long before I became a trustee, but some of you uh, were on boards when we you know, spent time setting curriculum, selecting textbooks, hiring teachers, hiring principals. That's not what trustees do now. Our, our, our job is to set direction, to ensure resources are in place so that staff can accomplish those objectives to monitor performance, holding the director of education accountable, and to bring forward the concerns of parents, students, and supporters of the board. That last one is important because I frequently will get trustees who talk about um, their rate paper, their constituents. I represent my constituents. Constituents is not in the act. The language in the act is the concern of parents, students, supporters of the board, and your job is not to solve them, it's simply to bring it forward. So what do we do instead? Well, I for some boards, we'll go in and we'll do what I call an audit of where they spend their meeting time. So we'll take the minutes of say the last six months, maybe the last nine months, and we literally map out uh, where they spent their time. And it's an eye opener because what many boards find is that the largest percentage of their time is on issues that in fact are, are really staff issues, not our issues. They are not talking about student achievement. 
They're not talking about strategy. They're not talking about student well-being. Instead, they're talking about issues that belong to staff. Um, they, uh, they also fail to distinguish between user and owner voices. Now, the, the next uh, workshop that we're going to be doing next month is going to be on uh, engagement, community engagement. And I'm going to spend way more time talking about this then. But, you know, for, once you are a trustee, you are going to, uh, everybody is going to know that, that you're a trustee and everybody's going to talk to you about school board issues. And so we think that those people that we run into in the grocery store, we think that um, those people that we run into when we pick our kids up after school who raise an issue, that that issue is an important issue for everyone. And it is generally not. First of all, we have to recognize it's one parent out of how many parents are in your, your kids' schools. But the other is, and, and this is um, this is this is Carter's language, and, and I really or Carver, and I really like Carver's language because what John Carver talked about is that when people come to us, when we're on a board and people come to us, we're going to hear two voices. One voice is a user, it's the customer voice. And the customer voice is, I don't like where my kid's bus stop is, I don't like the fact that my child is in a split class. Uh, those kinds of, you know, I, I, the, the teacher, all of those kinds of things. And uh, those kinds of issues, you're going to get the call, you're going to get the email, but then you pass it on to staff. That is not our work. Our work deals with owner voices and owners deal with values. And it's that question that I showed you in the previous slide. What do they value about the education we're providing for their children. That's going to help us to advance the thinking that we have so that when we do set strategy, when we do hold people accountable, that we're doing it at a higher level. And then, uh, you know, and again, this, this last point we're gonna talk about when we uh, do get together for the next uh, webinar. And that is we, we really, by and large, school boards have not uh, developed effective approaches to consult with those parents, students, and supporters of the board. So, um, you know, it, instead we rely on one-off, we rely on those phone calls. We are not strategic about going out and asking questions and shaping the dialogue. Or what we do is we want to do something, and so we go out and we look for validation of what we already want to do, as opposed to hearing and being willing to acknowledge that potentially what we thought was best was not best. But um, we, we don't have very we don't have very uh, effective approaches to doing that. Or what we do is we insist. Um, that staff go out and do a lot of these kinds of um, surveys. And the kinds of things that staff are going to deal with are going to be very different than, than what serves um, uh, trustees. I, as I said, those are, I'm going to talk about those a whole lot more in the October uh, webinar. But um, so what, in, what instead happens is we spend our time in, in board meetings just focusing on things that really are not our work. But again, it's because we don't know what else to do. So let me just, I, I've only got, you know, a few minutes. So Kathy, go back. What other kind of questions did people have? So I, ha I have a question here that I actually have heard uh, as a trustee over the years. You, I hear this uh, accusation about being the rubber stamp as opposed to feeling like we're having uh, deep, rich discussions at the board table, that feeling of, yeah. just rubber stamping anything staff brings. Um, one of you could just speak to that a bit. Sure, that's a great question. I hear that a lot as well. Remember what I said early on is that the number one skill trustees need to bring is the ability to ask questions. But it's asking those really great questions like the examples I gave you about the budget. That's the kinds of questions. So there's no, there's absolutely, well, so I, I was um, last month, I was uh, at PICO. And I did a, a workshop with the directors, uh, many of whom I know are with us today. And uh, I told them, you know, when you bring a report, what they should be doing is saying, okay, if I was in your shoes, here are two or three of the issues that I think you should be paying attention to. So that's, the, there's still questions. Trustees are going to ask about what are the risks on this? Um, what are we not paying attention to? 
you know, where, what was your, what was the reason that you chose this over this? So as opposed to those line by line, why are we doing this program versus that program? So absolutely, we should be asking questions, but they are questions that are at a board level, not at an operational level. The other thing about the questions that we need to ask is that they need to be related again to are that, you know, is this evidence that's going to advance what we've said our priorities are? It's not rubber stamping at all. Great. I, I actually, this is another question that's uh, kind of topical right now. As you, as you know, um, there's been a lot of concern about uh, public meetings versus uh, non-public and all that uh, right now about certain issues. But the question we have been asked is what committee meetings, if any, um, do not have to have the public at the meeting? And I'm not necessarily talking about in camera or closed sessions, but are there any committee meetings that can be uh, not open to public? Not a that's public a really, meeting, I guess. Yeah, that's a really great question. And you know what? It would it would be very issue specific. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for instance, needless to say, a com or, um, a suspension and expulsion are not open to the public. Right, that's, that's legislative, right? There are a number of legislative. There's a, the uh, legislative. That, yeah. But again, it's because they deal with those sensitive issues. Mm -hmm. But by and large, uh, the majority of the work that we do um, uh, would be would be open. They would be open to the public. Uh, again, it would just be, and, and it might be in the middle of a meeting. I mean, I, I remember when, when I was a trustee, we would be in the middle of a meeting and, um, and I can't remember the specific topic, but something would come up where someone would say, Hmm, I, I think that we just need to move into camera for a moment to, just to clarify something. And we move into camera, clarify something, and then we come out and we continue the meeting. So it would, it would, it would be very, it would be very, um, very issue specific for a board. Yeah, and I, and I think the reason why the question has been asked is um, just because of circumstances that are occurring at some of our, our meetings currently yeah. across the province. And it's become uh, sometimes difficult to, um, to do our work, to do our yeah. work under the, under the situation that we are. And uh, so I think that's why the question was asked. Yeah. And I really appreciate your answer. And, and I would reiterate, uh, just listen, I'm, just 20 years experience. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with stopping a meeting and saying, we yeah. need to clarify this, let's go in camera and, and yeah. being able to do it and, and being okay with doing that. Yeah. So Marianne, we've got only about three minutes left because we, we promised folks that we would keep it to an hour because it is lunchtime at work for a lot, for so many of us. So if you just wanted to wrap up, if there's anything further you wanted to say, and, and uh, we've, we've got like two and a half minutes. Yeah, no, the only thing that I want to say, I, and there's so much more that we could do. I mean, I know that for some of you, you're sitting, you're probably frustrated because you had, you know, really specific issues to your board, but within, you know, the time that we have, the reality is I've always maintained, I think that we know this stuff. I, you know, I, I've always maintained, we know what a good meeting um, is made up of. We know what constitutes it. There are some things that are specific to education though, because of legislation that we need to pay attention to, we are obligated to. And so much of what gets us into messes is our, our unwillingness to do what it takes to be an effective trustee. And that is to look at what our jobs are and to do our jobs and to work as a team. So I'm just gonna kind of leave it at that. And um, as I said, we've got some interesting other, uh, we're gonna be pursuing some of these other things more deeply in the next couple of months. So thanks very much for the time. Thank you, Marion. And, and now I know why your session at the AGM was so popular. I mean, I've written down a whole bunch of questions that I would like to kind of explore further and uh, hopefully sure. uh, within the next two uh, sessions that you'll maybe touch on them. Otherwise I'll be sending in a question to us. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or just asking. <laughs> um, I just reminded everybody that our next session is October 18th. And again, you'll be sent out the information for registration. Uh, it's called Meaningful Engagement, How to Hear from the Voices that Matter on the Issues that are Important. Again, what an important um, topic this one is because, you know, we're always wanting to consult, but how, how do you do it in a way that uh, answers all your questions, but uh, still does the work that you need to get done? 
So thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, team behind the scenes for making sure this went relatively seamlessly for us as our first webinar. I hope everybody uh, learns something or it, it uh, generates some discussion at your board because uh, that's what this is about. We all want to be able to do it, to do our jobs the best possible way because in the end, all we want to do is the right thing for kids. So thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, it's a, where I am, it's a beautiful, sunshiny day. So thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks.